over the land, there persists one domain still unconquered, the sea. There is a corner of this underwater world where nature seems to flaunt her beauty, her mystery, and her preeminence. Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Here, the creatures of the sea, in their most bizarre forms, weave complex life patterns, patterns broken by no intruder but one, as primitive as the reef itself. exploring the eastern coast of Australia, Captain James Cook's ship, the Endeavour, struck and held fast on a submerged coral reef, what we now call the Great Barrier Reef. It was a predictable result in a journey through such treacherous waters, dotted with what he describes as sandy, barren shoals and dreadful surf. Cook had no idea that he had run aground on part of a 1,200-mile-long reef. the largest mass of living coral in the world. The reef is not a solid wall, as its name implies, but a loosely connected chain of islands, reefs, and sand caves. Lying 10 to 100 miles from the mainland, they protect it from the fury of the open sea. The reef was created in a process that began over 100,000 years ago when the first colonies of coral animals clustered together and thrust up from the sea floor. The legacy of that work is reflected in the waters of the reef today. The newest layers of coral form a spectacular backdrop for so rich a variety of life as to rival any other natural area of the world for sheer abundance and diversity. should not be lulled by the reef's graceful beauty. For here, as in all ecosystems, the natural law of survival prevails. Eat and be eaten. On the reef, one's awareness of reality is constantly tested. Color, light, and motion meld to court the viewer's senses. Even the coral animals themselves, the tiny polyps, bond together in colonies of thousands to produce myriad forms. Sometimes they appear more like plants than animals, as in this soft coral. Sometimes they're arranged in stone-like structures. But regardless of their size or shape, the reef is formed by the coral polyp. Only the surface of the reef is alive. The coral animals form their outer limestone skeletons upon the dead remains of the older coral.
They emerge from their protective coverings in response to the basic stimulus of food, triggering each other in a wave-like action as they extend to grasp microorganisms swept past them by the current. The lifestyle of the coral is typical of all natural systems. For if the coral is to thrive, a very delicate set of conditions must be maintained, all in proper balance. Now, a starfish is threatening the coral, and so the balance of life of the entire reef. Man is the youngest inhabitant of the planet Earth. Today, he is probing his environment everywhere, seeking to understand the intricate systems which gave him life. Here in the timeless sea, where all life began, the effort takes on new dimensions. Our own science and technology, themselves not much older than the top few layers of coral, have enabled us to return to the sea by carrying an artificial atmosphere with us. But despite our scientific sophistication, we are confounded by one of Earth's most primitive forms of life, the crown of thorns starfish. Should we make an all-out effort to decimate the starfish population? Or should we choose as a course merely to let nature deal with it in her own way? Either course could be disastrous to the survival of the reef. At present, science knows little about Acanthaster planki, the scientific name for the crown of thorns. It is known that the animal is a sea star with poisonous spines, that it is undergoing a population explosion throughout the Pacific, and that the starfish is a voracious eater, feeding only on live coral. It eats by turning its stomach inside out over the live coral. Then its enzymes dissolve and digest the living tissue. When competing for food, the starfish, moving on hundreds of tiny tube feet, can cover as much as a foot a minute, leaving behind the bare white coral skeleton. It may be 20 years or 100 years before the reef recovers. No one can say what caused the starfish to increase so dramatically. Perhaps it's a periodical occurrence that we just haven't noticed before. Some scientists believe the increase is due to a decline of some natural predator either during its larval stage or when it's grown. The only known predator of the mature sea star is the giant triton. One theory is that shell collectors have removed so many tritons that the few remaining cannot control the starfish. But there were probably never enough tritons to control it. The triton prefers to eat other kinds of starfish. And if the triton does catch the sea star, it takes a week to devour it. Recently, man has tried to control the starfish himself, injecting a formaldehyde solution into the animal. But this is obviously not feasible for the thousands of miles of Pacific reefs also threatened by the crown of thorns. The only reason to resort to such an expensive and unworkable scheme, even in trying to clear just a small part of one reef, is that we know so little about the organism that we don't know anything better to do. And it may well develop that with additional information, we will find that the increase is natural, will subside on its own, and that the reefs are not really threatened at all. The fact is, we don't know the facts about Acanthaster. Yet problems can't be solved without facts. And if the problem is urgent, it is probably too late to acquire the facts. Only one human activity is devoted to getting facts in advance. It is called basic research. And more than anything else we do, it determines how well we are able to deal with problems as they become critical, whether it's a starfish plague or keeping the Earth alive.
These dolphins are man's closest cousins in the waters of the Great Barrier Reef, since they are air-breathing mammals as we are. But our kinship with reef life ends there. We have studied, and are therefore somewhat familiar with, the behavior patterns of land animals. But in this water habitat, the patterns are more difficult to discern. In such a diverse ecosystem as a coral reef, the trained eye of a professional is the first requirement in understanding your surroundings. Although I've been diving for many years in different parts of the world, I've never explored the waters of the Great Barrier Reef. This is Ben Crop, Australia's foremost underwater photographer, who did the film sequences underwater for the program. He and his wife, Eva, are true citizens of the reef and they're going to accompany me through its waters. The sense of freedom and release usually associated with diving is heightened by the exotic atmosphere of the Great Barrier Reef. But from the scientific standpoint, one reason why more basic research has not been accomplished here is due to the physical problems of working in an underwater environment. It is a monumental task even to catalog the thousands of varieties of organisms of the reef. This fact was made very real to us by the difficulties we encountered during the production of the program. Since some ocean organisms are so difficult to film, it was occasionally necessary to document their behavior under controlled conditions. But never did we change the natural actions of the animals involved. Whether or not we understand the behavior patterns of fish, the actions of most fish are fascinating to us. But to the fish, all their actions are meaningful. To feed, to reproduce, and to survive. When the coral reef system is in proper balance, each organism fits into its complementary feeding niche. These butterfly fish, feed on the coral itself. The surgeon fish eats the plant and animal life associated with the coral. Some fish even strain the sea floor for food. The wrasses screen the sand to eat the tiny crabs and worms living in it, sifting the sand and ejecting it through their gills or actually spitting it back out. <laughs> 